Welcome to Old Mop 455 shop again. We've got the 68 Javelin up in the air, and now that the engine, the tranny, and the interior are, have all been taken care of, now we can finally get to strengthening the chassis. This has gone on ever since guys put V8s into a little Model A. When you've got more power than what the body or the chassis on the old cars was designed for, you're going to fold them up. Just like when they make a convertible out of a regular car. Back in the day they had C-channel frame and then once you remove the top that reduces the rigidity of like a Roman arch. You chop that arch out of there and then the, the chassis one moves so then they box the frame. So a lot of guys like to start out with a boxed frame and then they had a stronger chassis when they had more power. As you keep building more power, like a funny car or a dragster, you get more and more tubes involved. But if you make the thing so strong and you don't have the power, all you're doing is weighting down your vehicle and you got to pull more weight and you're going to go slower. So like if you got a NASCAR car that's going to be bashing into people, they've got tubes all around and it, it, it makes it heavier. On a drag strip car, you're just going on straight away, you might bump into somebody or you hit the walls. But if you go into an accident, it's usually by yourself tumbling straight on and they have minimal tubing to get the strength that they want and basically you want you know, triangulated bars that make it strong and they're attaching at the suspension points so when you put the power to the car those suspension points aren't flexing. You'll see some guys with a regular car with no roll cage and they dump the clutch with stick shift and the back end's hopping up and down. Well, if you had your chassis stronger and that didn't flex and you had ladder bars or something, you would end up being that power that's going into the chassis is going to get controlled better through the suspension, either the coil over shocks or the, the attachment points that you have, leaf springs or whatever, coils, and it's going to transmit through the chassis and then you want all that weight to be on the tires and get going. If you've got a car that's like a pretzel, you know, things are going to start bending and before that input gets put to the tires all this other flexing has to go on in order to get your suspension to react the way you want it. If you've got a circle track car and you're going to be thrown into sharp corners some of these cars are going to be you know twisting this much. Guys have had T-tops popping out and back you know, seat pillars twisting, windows cracking, so you end up having, if you're going to put more power into a car than what it was designed for, on this one we have to strengthen the chassis. Now normally on a unitized body, you'll have the front frame horns that hold the cradle where the engine is, and then they tie into a firewall and the rocker panels and you get the strength in this area and then they just kind of come back a ways and it's like a cantilevered you know attachment point so it can't go anywhere but when you start having um, a lot of power that starts tearing it apart and these rockers act like the sides of a ladder and where your seats and your floor pans and all that, you'll see that it goes up, down, up, down. They're just like rungs on a ladder. And that gives it its rigidity. But it still can do this stuff. So we're going to end up attaching points from the front cradle to the back cradle where the suspension is. And that's going to stiffen up the chassis and we'll even tie it into the rockers that are there already. And then you'll probably notice that if we jack it up, 
it'll stay straighter than allowing it to twist. You know, if we just jack up one corner, and then we'll know that when we hit a bump, this will go up and down without any of the other flexing of the chassis. If you notice, this whole rocker panel and this rocker panel are like the sides on a ladder. And then you've got braces that go across where the seats attach. And then you'll see the floor pan dip down, go up, dip down, and then you got a footboard that goes at an angle. Then it goes up. And then here's the rails for the suspension. And it's it's a economical way to make a production car and using less metal, keeping the body lighter than having a full frame and it did its job for what it was intended for, a mass-produced production car. Well now we want to put more power to it. And we're gonna tie these things together. We're going to tie this all the way back to this one. Might even have them going across. And when you can tie that, that transmission tunnel together, that stiffens it up like a pipe going down the center of the compartment. And it will act like a drive shaft loop. So if the drive shaft ever breaks, you don't have this thing flying all around and wrecking parts. So now we're about to work on cutting out metal uh, parts out of these patterns that have already been made after we've scraped all this. This undercoating actually saved this vehicle, but it's difficult to scrape off. I mean, if you didn't have a lift and you were underneath the car trying to do this, it would be a real problem. But we're going to be tying this subframe all the way back, and this is our starting point is to fill in this void. And when we have two sheets of metal going across, and fill in this pocket, then we'll continue, and we'll keep going back. But now we gotta start off cutting out from pattern to metal. As you will see, this pattern is fit right in here. And it wiggled around a little. We don't have to do anything too perfect, but I just went up to the highest line, because it, it dropped down. And if you use paint markers, then the plasma cutters just got to cut through paint. This is the same one that we used on the Cougar. Guys that spend thousands of dollars on a plasma cutter, unless you're doing a shop all the time, you know, work making parts, they're nice. In my situation, I bought this thing way back in 1985. It's a cheapie. And it's it helps but you still got to grind and if you don't have a steady hand it's jagged best thing i like is a bandsaw it's it's rough it's already cold to the touch but you, you got to finish grinding this is like an old one the new ones Cut like butter. I mean, they can cut through steel this thick. Well, like we said before, that when you work with an off-brand vehicle, you have to fabricate everything. Now, if you're going to tie into this, expect to be doing it for quite a long time because it was just first getting all the undercoating off making templates, cut this off, they're tacked in right now. And then we gotta get a strip going all the way down to here, a strip going down there, and then the piece that goes over the top, so it'll be like a channel going to here. And then we gotta make a area that'll be like another torque box with a drive shaft loop. So the exhaust can go through all this, and this has to be modified so that we can unbolt the area that cuts across so that we can drop the drive shaft. So this is going to be a lot of making patterns and welding metal in here and then this whole structure will be tied in from front to back and will make it really rigid. Normally the subframe up here that's holding the motor cradle and the suspension is 
actually acting like a cantilever. Like if you extended your beams out of your house and you had a bay window or a deck, think of it like that. And it was only this long. When we're extending it out here, that's definitely making it stronger for the front cradle going into a longer support, like between more beams of your house, that you could put more weight out front, it's not going to move. But when we tie this all together, we're trying to get the rear suspension to be locked in tighter to less flex in the whole chest. Four of these all the way across. And this will go up into the structure of the floor. And this whole thing will just continue on. When the wheel hits a bump, and that used to transition into that shock tower, you see a lot of Fords, Chevy, you know, Camaros have some too, where they tie the firewall to the shock towers. That's all trying to avoid all this shake, especially if you've got a convertible and you've cut the top off. You hit bumps and it just sends a shock wave through the, the body. They call it cowl shake. Well, now you're going way back further. You get it stronger. Back in the days when you had a full frame, normally it was just a C-channel frame and then for the convertible they had a full box. Well, as this strengthening or stiffening of the chassis along this way is going this is where we really want to tie into so it wasn't in alignment with this so it's got to come and then this box so it's taken like a 90 then over a lot of guys that are building a frame on a square tubing have steps because they've got their rails moved in and stuff like that so this whole frame rail is just taking a 90 degree so that all the way from the front subframe to the back will be all tied together. Well, you can see we're progressing our way down tying this in and because of the floor being different thicknesses and ribs that are stamped into the floor already for rigidity one side's uh, fatter width than the other and we're trying to keep everything level, so you know nobody's going to see it, but the guy I'm working with is very, very fastidious, and he wants everything perfect so that it looks like one uniform channel. After it's all ground, and he seam seals it and paints it, he wants it to look like it was made that way. Everything's way more firmed up. And inside you can really tell it's it's stiff. After the exhaust is done, we might end up making a section that goes across, but we gotta get the final exhaust done. Doesn't look like it would be that much, but I would rate this another 10 on the pain in the ass factor. It's not that hard, it's just a lot of time consuming fitting, grinding. So these are the patterns of the pieces of metal that needed to be cut out in order to connect that front section. You know, this is the more difficult one to make. This was a little pocket. These are all channels that are actually for uh, the floor strengthening and the seats bolt to them. And in the back, there's a little torque box, you know, back where the leaf spring would be. With my buddy 67 Camaro, and he's got a nice one. He ended up tracing out where it needed to tie in from the front subframe to the back subframe. And they're a bracket that most of them are bolt up, you know, and the front subframe could still be changed out if you got an accident. Some guys weld a tube that's, you know, cut at an angle at the front and weld it to the front subframe. They cut the floor and they weld the square tube to it. And some people think that wrecks the value of the car. This looks just like a stock, you know, floor pan now. You could sand that all down and re repaint it and we'll put that dynamat in there. You'll never know any floor modification has been done from underneath. It doesn't even look very obtrusive. When guys have rusted out Camaros and Mustangs, 
you can see this pushing the floor up as they get more and more weak. And some guys have done hole shots and got into some real shake and all of a sudden the car tire is up into the fender and they're like, what the hell happened? And then they have to push it down, hammer it down, weld extra plates in there and then sell the car. And then some poor unsuspecting young person that thinks, oh, this is getting a really sweet ride. Usually they look good on the outside, but every place else, you know, they're rusted out. Cars that have been sitting in the backyard, these will get, you know, if they got a flat tire and they're in the soil, this will all rot out here. And, you know, if they have like a coil over suspension, there's guys that have had, you know, brackets break free and all of a sudden the tail end of the car is steering on its own.